Let's look at point three, verses 12 through 26. We must be watchful of our blind spots and hypocrisy. We must be watchful of our blind spots and hypocrisy. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears, he and his friend Hurrah the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance of, to Enayim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me, that you may come into me? He said, He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it, He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her, and he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at Enayim, at the roadside? And they said, No cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Abraham replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not know her again. Judah's unnamed wife dies. It's actually interesting how quickly his mourning is over. We don't know how long he mourned, but Tamar is still mourning for her dead husband during the, before he, his wife died and after. His, his mourning appears to be short. Again, he's a man that has no deep love, just a man who follows his passion and impulse. Tamar's in mourning. She takes off her widow garments whenever she finds out that uh, Judah is going up for the sheep-sharing festivities. Uh, this time of year, the gods would be entertained by uh, humans having uh, relations. Uh, with one another. And the idea there is that they, they believe that gods would bless their land with fertility. And the way that you entice the gods to bless your land with fertility is to entice them to be fertile. And so what they, they created was a system where there would be temple prostitutes that men could go have relations with, that gods would watch that, and then they would be fertile as well. It's, it's a control system. That's kind of where we don't function as as gross as this, maybe, maybe. But our sinfulness causes us to want to control God. This is a way of controlling God who controls the the crops and the the fertility. Tamar, Tamar, she hears about Judah coming. She takes off her widow's garments. She puts a veil on her face, knowing this is the sign of a temple prostitute. This is a way to connect with the gods, if you're a man, as well. Judah sees her and is grossly blunt and to the point. Let me come into you. He's not a wise man. He doesn't make wise decisions. He is ruled by his passion and by his impulse. He does not discipline his desires for God and against sin. 
And as we will see, this leads to danger. This always leads to danger and destruction. Tamar is going to outwit him. She asks for a pledge. She says, well, I'll give you a goat. That, that seems like a hefty promise. That seems like a hefty wage for the prostitute. She asks for a pledge, and he, he, he says, I'll give you, well, she asks for these three things, the, the signet and the cord and the staff. Now, it's interesting. These are great symbols. Remember, Judah fools his father with a cloak. The story before this. Judah takes the coat of many colors and says, look, an animal has devoured your son. Judah uses a, a garment to fool his father. Here, he's going to be fooled by a garment. He's going to be fooled by the prostitute's veil. Contrast this with the garment in the next chapter over. Joseph is tempted by Potiphar's wife, and he leaves his garment. Those things are supposed to bring the, the, the symbolism to you, you have a great contrast between Judah and Joseph. Judah, who is throwing himself into sexual sin and is fooled by a cloak, whereas Joseph, he flees sexual sin and is punished because of a cloak. He's not presented as all that smart. Judah. He's not aware of his circumstances. He has a fear of looking stupid, but he, he really just can't help himself. Now let's look at what these three things are. The signet, this would be the, the sign and the seal, kind of a, the wax imprint you would put on a letter. It'd be the way you would make transactions. When the clay was soft over when you bought something or when you made a legal transaction, you would roll the signet and the seal. It was your personal mark saying, I agree, or I am claiming this as my own. The cord would be the cord tied to the signet. It would be very personalized. Well, the staff, that represents the power. This is basically like someone asking you for your credit card and your social security card. The things that identify you the most in, in our culture and in our society. The things that someone can control you by. He gives them to her. Not wives. The, the, the one that really stands out, and, and I couldn't find anyone to, to comment on this, but it, giving up his staff reminded me of the promise to Judah. In 40, Genesis 49 verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. That's a promise for the Messiah. That promise is that the Messiah is going to come from Judah, and it's symbolized with a staff. And here Judah has given his staff to a prostitute. If you're an Israelite in the Exodus, you're reading this, you're thinking, no, Judah, you're supposed to have the staff. How do you give up the covenant promise? He's putting it all in jeopardy. He's putting our salvation in jeopardy. Well, thank you. Thankfully, God is much more powerful than him. There's also a startling contrast here. Judah is more faithful to his, a pledge to a prostitute than to his daughter-in-law. He's supposed to have pledged a husband for Tamar, and he's not going to be faithful to that, but he's faithful to a pledge to a prostitute. He then sends a, a goat by his friend, the Adulamite, hurrah. They can't find her because she doesn't exist as a temple prostitute. And then he says, well, we just need to stop because we're going to be laughed at if we continue. He, he's more interested in keeping his reputation. Now notice it says that about three months later, there, there are definite time markers in this story. The first one is in verse 1. It happened at that time. Verse 12, in the course of time. And now here are our third time marker, about three months later, Judah finds out that Tamar is pregnant. He jumps quickly to the most harshest penalty. Burn her. He jumps to the conclusion on a second-hand account. Now, if this woman you think is the cause for your son's death, she's a real burden to you. You don't want to release her, apparently. He doesn't want to release her, but he, he doesn't want anything to do with her. He doesn't continue to, to care for her as a father or a father-in-law. I think he's jumping at the opportunity to just get rid of her. Burn her. It's a quick judgment. But then, of course, the great turn of events. When the, the point where the tension of the story gets highest, she sends ahead her evidence. 
the staff, the cord, and the signet of Judah. Now put yourself in Judah's place there. He has just stood up and said, burn her. And for however long it took to get the, the items to travel all the way back to Judah, he sees them. The man who I am pregnant by, these are his, this is a social security card, this is a credit card, this is identification. He's faced with a dilemma. He's faced with his hypocrisy. He's faced with his guilt. He's faced with the fact that he should die for what he's done. His declaration was right. She should be burned for her sin. She should be destroyed for her sin. And now he has to come face to face and say, I should die for my sin. We see the only wise thing Judah says or does in this entire story, she is more righteous than I. He's humbled. He doesn't humble himself. He is humbled. He is embarrassed. He is confronted. He is faced with his guilt. She is more righteous than I. You see, there's a, there's a dirty double standard. We, we can look at the story. We can look at one double standard. It's okay for men to be sexually promiscuous, but women can't be. That, that's a horrible double standard. If you think that, gentlemen, it will destroy you. It's foolish. But the double standard I'm talking about is that we want people judged for the same kinds of thin, sins that we're guilty of. But we don't want to be judged. We want God to judge other people who sin against us, but we don't want God to judge us for our sin. Judah, in this declaration, he is confessing his sin, I believe. He's confessing. He's humbled. We may even see here the beginning of his conversion, a, con a confrontation of his own sin. See, friends, this text reveals the wickedness of humanity. This text is about us. This text is here for us today, this morning. It's here to show us the sin that is dwelling in our hearts, the sin that we too are capable of. This text is to make us afraid of our sin. Our sin is wicked, it is gross, it is perverse. This passage is extremely helpful. Because if we look at it, we should identify with it. We should see how selfish and perverse we are. We should see that we have forsaken our primary calling in glorifying God and loving God and obeying God. Our sin needs to stare us in the face. Now those of you who are married, you have probably gone to a, a jewelry store to, to buy a diamond. And when you're at a jewelry store, it's, it's pretty interesting what they do. They, they get out a black cloth. And what they do with the black cloth is they, they let the, the diamond glisten with that black backdrop. That way you see the beautiful contrast of the beauty of the diamond versus the black backdrop, the, the, the cloth, the backdrop. You see, we're not going to see the beauty of the gospel we're not going to see the love glimmering and shining. We're not going to see the love of God that conquered our sin until we see it with the backdrop of our own sin. We need the darkness to be clear to us so when the light shines, it illuminates us. It illuminates even more sin. It illuminates the power of the gospel. It illuminates Jesus Christ. The gospel only shines when it is seen with the backdrop of our sin. Without our sin being clear to us, the gospel is not going to be clear. The gospel is only sweet after tasting the bitterness of sin and death. The gospel is only light if we recognize it with darkness. Friends, if you do not think you are a sinner deserving God's wrath this morning, I don't think you're a Christian. If you cannot honestly look at yourself in the mirror and say, I have sinned and I am worthy of God's wrath, your confession of Christ is empty because Christ is only saving you from your sin and God's wrath and death. If you're confessing Christ but not confessing that you deserve God's wrath, you need to take account of your confession. 